Some people are helpless because of what has happened to them early in their life. You see, not everybody that comes along in front of me has the same education I do. Not everybody that comes along had the same great parents I did. Not everybody that comes along has mentors and people that I could learn from and learn how to do this life. A lot of people in this world are just harassed and helpless because of the circumstances they're in. And no matter what is going on in someone's life, I need to have compassion for them. stolen identity and we learn back in Genesis chapter 3 that we were made in the image of God and because of the fact that we wanted to be like God our identity was stolen but God had a plan for us and in that plan he was going to send his one and only son down to this earth so that he could die for our sins and our identity could be restored And in that identity being restored, he has given us a comforter, a helper, the Holy Spirit to come alongside us so that we may know how to live in this world today. And because of that, he has given us a job to do. Wouldn't it be great if all we had to do was confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, be buried with him in baptism, and just go straight to heaven? Y'all don't sound very enthusiastic about that. (laughs) Maybe one or two. But, But I think sometimes we forget that our home, our identity is going to be restored in heaven. But in the meantime, we have a job to do. You see, God wants us to go out into the world and he wants us to teach other people about his son and how to get their identity restored. And in doing that, there's a couple of problems. If you look at your sermon notes, there's two problems of helping others find their identity. Number one is we're sending the wrong message. We're sending the wrong message. And I don't know if you've gone out into the world and looked at what people are saying about Christians, but it's not saying, the world's not saying, oh, Christians are the most loving people around. The world is not saying Christians are the most kind people around. It's not even saying that Christians are the most caring people around. We're sending the wrong message. I have a friend of mine, he sent me a, a, a a video or a link to something on Netflix called God and Country. And the world is seeing Christianity as a political movement more so than a Christ movement. In other words, they're talking about how Christian nationalism has come along and has become what Christians are all about. And if you remember what happened on January the 6th, you will remember that there were people in there who claimed to be Christian, people who prayed and said that they were doing God's will, which were really and truly were not doing God's will. And in the church itself, sometimes our political views are more important to each other than our Christ views. You see, we're sending the wrong message to the world. The second thing is there is a lack of urgency. There is a lack of urgency. We kind of get up in the morning and, you know, we start our day like we've always started our day. We, we go to our work or we do whatever we're going to do like we always do. And we think, well, you know, it's always going to be the same, so I don't really have to do anything different. And, and we just go through our day forgetting that we have a command to go out into the world and to teach others. You see, our job is to introduce people to Jesus Christ. Amen? It doesn't mean that they're going to accept Jesus Christ, does it? For the most part, I talk to people about being a Christian, about what Jesus has done, and for the most part, they say that's nice, and they go on. You see, God did his part by bringing his son so that we may have the redemption from sin. And we do our part by going out and introducing others to Jesus. 
But it's up to the other person to accept that invitation. But if we're not doing our part, we know God's doing his part, but if we're not doing our part, other people don't have a chance to do their part. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And the reality of it is, is we're not telling people that. We're not telling people about that. So how do we do this? If you look at your sermon notes on the inside page, it says spiritual influence flows out of a relationship built. And I want you to uh, underline out of a relationship. Spiritual influence flows out of a relationship. And the reason why I want you to understand that is there are a lot of people in the world today, and I've seen them over and over, they'll hold up signs and basically say, turn or burn. Turn to God or you're going to burn in hell. That's basically the message they're sending. But that's not how God intended for the world to hear about him. Now, preaching is important. I think it's very important, especially because I get paid to do it. But preaching is important, but what really makes a difference is the relationships that we build every day. Now, I am gregarious by nature. I have a personality that I go out and I meet people and I get to know people. I'm not really scared of meeting somebody new. And I, everywhere I go, I try to build relationships with people. Nancy calls it, Neil's collecting somebody else because I collect people. And I love people. And, and you may be saying, well, you know, Neil, that's not me. I'm kind of like in the shadows. I don't like being out front. That's the kind of thing. You know what? It doesn't matter whether you're gregarious or whether you're shy. You're building relationships whether you like it or not. I, I have my oldest son when he was 14 or 15. I asked him where he wanted to go to dinner that night. And he says, Dad, is there any way we can go someplace you don't know someone? And I said, well, we can, son, but as soon as we get there, guess what? I'm going to know someone. But you're not like that, maybe. You're not like that. But I'm going to tell you, you've got people you work with that you have a relationship. You may have somebody in your family that you have a relationship. You may have a neighbor you have a relationship. And whoever you have a relationship with, that is the beginning of introducing them to Christ. Amen? And we've got to do it in three different ways. Number one, we've got to have a good life. We've got to have a good life. First Peter, don't get ahead of me up there with the slides. <laughs> I don't know who's doing the slides. Stand up so I can rebuke you. No, <laughs> it's okay. I'm just teasing. Don't get ahead of me. But anyway, we've got to have a good life. It says in First Peter, Chapter 2, 11 and 12. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war on your soul. Underline this part. Live such good lives among the pagans. Now when it says pagans there, it's not talking about people who sacrifice their children. It's talking about people who do not know God. And so the word pagan there, a lot of times we think of it, we're going to go out and we're going to convert people in the, in the far east or someplace that, you know, sacrificing animals. No, it's talking about anybody that does not know God. So we're going to live such good lives among the people of the world that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits. Now... I want you to see here in your sermon notes, we can go to the next slide now, don't confuse a sheltered life with a good life. We all have friends in the church. If you don't have a friend in the church, statistically speaking, if you don't have just at least one good friend in the church, within six months of belonging to a church, you're going to go somewhere else. And it may be that you go to another church, or it may very well be that you quit going to church at all. 
You need to have some good friends in the church. Now, Santa Claus got up here this morning, and he talked to you about the fact that you need to join a life group. And, and have y'all ever been to a church that's so blessed that we get to have Santa Claus do announcements for us? I mean, that is just amazing. I was thinking about this this, this morning, you know. You, get, you got Santa Claus doing an invitation. You got this really good-looking preacher. Man, y'all got it going on. But you know what you've got to have? You've got to have friends in the church. That's the reason why Shaq was encouraging life groups. If you're not in a life group, you need to belong to one because you've got to have people that you can laugh with and that you can cry with. This past Friday night, we did something way out of the ordinary. We got a life group together without any lesson notes. And we just had fun together. You see, that's what this is all about. So we've got to have each other. But you don't want to confuse a sheltered life with a good life. You know, I get with my life group friends and spend time with them, and I get built up, I get renewed, I get loved, and then I can go out into the world and I can deal with difficult people. Amen? And if you're one of these people that everything you do has to be centered around something at church. Everything you do has to be centered around Christian. I mean, there's some people that won't hire people because they're not Christians, that they're looking for a Christian plumber. Look, if you're looking for a Christian doctor, I would recommend this. Find a good doctor and hope he's a Christian. Because at the end of the day, we are to be an influence on the world and we've got to have the right influence on the world. And we can't do it by just staying in the church. We've got to get out into the world. You know, there are people that, that I come across that have no, no belief whatsoever. And that's okay because I am trying to show them that I have a good life and sometimes people will not know that I'm a Christian and a lot of times people won't know that I am a preacher and they will ask me how is it Neil that you are so happy all the time and guess what that does that opens the door to tell them about my faith the second thing we need to have is we need to have good deeds in the same way let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds. Now, they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. We have to be a people that others see our good deeds. But they need to see our good deeds in such a way that it's building relationship with them. Now, I'm going to tell you that I'm sometimes I get out into the world and I'm driving along and I see somebody that is asking for money on the side of the road. And, and there's times where I help and there's times when I don't. I, I try to discern what's going on there. Uh, I, I had a birth I went to a birthday party for a guy that was an AA and the only people, there were two people there that were Christians that weren't in part of AA. Everybody else in the group was AA members. And they were not just any AA members. These were the kind of people that were on the side of the road. When they needed money, they would hold a gas can out. They had a gas can in the back of their car. Now, this is what they told me. They had a gas can in the back of their car. And whenever they needed money, they would park their car and they would go and walk to a corner and they would hold the gas can and they would hold up a sign, need, get, need money for gas. So it looked very legitimate. And, and so when I was hearing all this, they were laughing about the fact that people would give them money just because they were holding up a gas can. And, and one of the guys was saying, you know what worked for me one time? Is, is I just held up a sign that, uh, let's be honest, I just need beer. And he was talking about how much money he got. And my thoughts are, is when I see somebody on the side of the road, are they legitimately hurting or are they just scamming me? 
And sometimes I give them money and sometimes I don't. But you know what we need to do is we need to do those good deeds by building a relationship. And the only way that you're going to build a relationship with someone is for them to go someplace with you so you can sit and you can talk to them and find out what's really going on in their life. You see, you can just do good deeds, but if they don't build a relationship, all they are is doing good deeds. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't do good deeds sometimes that don't build relationship. What I am saying is you need to look for ways to good to do good deeds that build a relationship with others. Look down at your sermon notes. Good deeds are acts of kindness that build a relationship. Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 36 says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. This is what I want you to notice. When he saw the crowds, underline this, he had compassion on them underline he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd he had compassion on them now this is a struggle that I have from time to time because people will come to me and they will say Neil I need help with this and I will know for a fact that they put themselves in that situation I I, I know for a fact that they have made choices in their life to get to that particular situation. And they think that because I'm here and I'm a part of their life, I'm going to just open up my bank account and give them whatever they need. And there are others that I know the life they're living has put them in the circumstances they are. Here's the problem I have. Instead of showing compassion to someone who is hurting, I judge them. I judge them. If anybody ever knew what was going on in somebody's life, it was Jesus. And he had compassion on them because they were harassed and they were helpless. And what I have come to learn over my years is some people are harassed because of what happened to them when they were young. Some people are helpless because of what has happened to them early in their life. You see, not everybody that comes along in front of me has the same education I do. Not everybody that comes along had the same great parents I did. Not everybody that comes along has mentors and people that I could learn from and learn how to do this life. A lot of people in this world are just harassed and helpless because of the circumstances they're in. And no matter what is going on in someone's life, I need to have compassion for them. Because it's difficult to do that. Because what I've learned is it's a lot easier for me to judge others and where they are in their life instead of really showing them the compassion that Christ had. Doesn't mean I have to give away everything I own. But what it does mean is no matter what I do for other people, I need to have compassion on them. And that's not always easy because sometimes I'm harassed and I'm helpless too but I'm going to say this to you if you really understand what Jesus Christ did for you by dying on the cross what he did for you by bringing you in to a family then you are going to have compassion on those who have been harassed and helpless too The third thing you need to have is a good answer. A good answer. It says in 1 Peter 3, 15 through 16, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. And then it says, always, underline the word always, 
Be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. One of the things that bothers me from time to time is we get lumped in a big group of people and I don't know whether you've ever noticed this or before, but if a plane crashes, what makes the news is the plane crash. Have you noticed that? It doesn't, the news is never made that we went an entire day and 15,000 planes landed without crashing. But when one doesn't, that's what makes the news. Same thing with church leaders. When one falls, that's what makes the news. It doesn't make the news that there's 15,000 others that didn't fall that day. The reason why I'm telling you this is because we've got to learn to give people a good answer because there's always going to be somebody on the fringe that in the name of Christianity or in the name of Christ is doing something they shouldn't be doing. And so we've got to be able to live such good lives and do such good deeds and give good answers to those that ask. You see, one of the things that you want to know is, and it's in your sermon notes here, a good answer is the right words at the, I've got it as the right words and attitudes towards others, but I had to add something to that. I, I added to that this morning, or last night, a good answer is the right words and the right attitude at the right time. Add, add, add that to your notes. Because what I've learned over the years is that sometimes when people are hurting, sometimes when people are grieving, sometimes when people are, are just in a mess, all they need is somebody to sit next to them. That's all they need. They don't need any wisdom from you. You, you know, one of the things that... that just surprises me from time to time how we feel like we've got to say something to somebody and sometimes all we need to do is let them know that we're next to them and that we love them because a lot of times when you speak you don't have the right words because you really don't know what to say and a lot of times it may very well be somebody's going through something that you know nothing about but as long as you are there. My mom, I was talking to her not too long ago, and, and I was talking about my dad's funeral and all the people that came through, and I was asking her about a couple of people that I couldn't remember who they were, but they had said such and such to me, and I was talking to her about it, and my mom said to me, she says, I don't remember what people said as much as I remember that they were there. And sometimes all it takes is for you to be there but you got to have the right words and the right attitude at the right time because sometimes you may be saying the right wo words, but you have the wrong attitude. Or sometimes you have the right attitude or the wrong words, and sometimes you're not doing it at the right time. It says instead, speaking the truth in love. And I want you to underline this, we will grow. We speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. So many of us think that being a mature Christian is having all the right answers in Bible class. I, I grew up in a church where there were men who prided themselves on knowing the Bible backwards, forwards, and in between. They had all the answers to everything. And when a hard question came up, they had an answer. Well, let me explain this to you. That is not spiritual maturity. That is knowing things. The most spiritual people I have run across don't necessarily know their Bible that well. But they are the people that are speaking the truth in love so that they can grow up. You realize how we mature as a Christian is when we share our faith. Not so much as how much we know. When we have faith in bad situations, 
That's how we show the world how mature we are. Because I've known some good Bible teachers and I've known some good men and women who have known their Bibles forwards and backwards can quote scripture. But when challenges come, you see their lack of maturity. We've got to speak the truth and love so that we can grow up and become mature Christians. Well, there's six things you need to remember about sharing your faith and giving those good answers and those good deeds and that good life. Number one is there's no magic bullet. There's no magic bullet. You're not going to be able to have a phrase that you can just put out there all the time. I, I grew up and we went through several evangelism classes. And one of them was is that we took our Bible and we outlined in the Bible all the things that we needed to do. Now, you need to take them here. So write this in the front of your Bible, and then you go and you take them here and you show them this verse, and, and then you take them here and you show them this verse, and, and this is what you do. And, and then when you get to the end where it's baptized, they're going to get up and they're going to go get in the water before you get there. And it's not how it works. You see, I love those classes that I took because I learned a lot. But there's not one right way of converting somebody. I, I grew up in a time where newer versions of the Bible were called newer perversions of the Bible. And you use something other than the King James and you got kicked out of church. I, I hate to say this, but Nancy and I moved to Tampa. And the very first church we attended I came in, I had a new King James Study Bible that I had bought for myself. It was a new international version, and I loved it because it was, it was speaking to me in ways that it hadn't spoken before. And, and I walked into the church building, and the elders got up, and they said, uh, if you have anything other than a King James Bible, we would ask that you leave it at home and not bring it to church anymore. And that's what we heard the very first Sunday we were there. And guess what? We didn't go back. My father hated that I used the New International Version until he converted his soon-to-be daughter-in-law to Christ with the New International Version. There's not one version, there's not one right answer. There's no magic bullet. Look at what Jesus happened to Jesus. He said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except for lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. And underline this, he was amazed at their lack of faith. He was amazed at their lack of faith. It, here's the thing that's encouraging to me. is Jesus, God's only son who had all the answers, who preached the word, who preached it correctly, who knew what the answers were to everything. He could do miracles and all that, but people didn't have faith in him. So when I go out and I teach people and when I go out and explain the gospel and they don't believe it's okay because even Jesus was, was amazed at others' lack of faith. The second thing you need to remember, it is impossible to have impact without contact. On hearing this, Jesus said, is it, is it not the healthy who need a doctor but the sick? But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not a sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. The reason why I want you to look at this verse is Jesus is saying that it is okay for us to have fellowship with one another, but our job is to go out into the world and to look for people that don't act like us, that don't vote like us, that don't smell like us, that don't talk like us. Because we have a message of Jesus Christ and he is able to restore their identity to what it once was. And we need to remember that it is impossible to have impact 
without contact with the world. Number three, the test of influence is influence. It says, therefore, go and make disciples. We cannot have influence on the world unless we were out in the world. We cannot have influence on the world unless we go out into the world. I love the fact that when we go out places, we have an opportunity to invite them into this fellowship, invite them into a loving congregation. In my opinion, there is no more loving congregation in the world than this one right here. And it's not because I believe that, it's because the people that have come to visit have told me that. I have to believe it because you pay me to believe it. Everybody else is saying it on their own accord. Number four, come and see is more effective than shut up and listen. And this is about the woman at the well, then leaving her water jar, the woman went back into town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I did. Could this be the Messiah? All we need to do is invite people to come and see. We have people that come here from time to time that have just been invited and want to become a part of something that's greater than themselves. They want to know Jesus in a way that helps them through their daily life. They want to know Jesus on a personal level. You see, I don't think the world is looking for something else to do. We have so much to do every single day. I mean, there was a Bucks game Friday night. I didn't see it, but I heard about it. And, and, and my neighbor said, did you go to the Bucks game? And I said, I didn't even know there was a Bucks game. He said, well, you should have been there. And I said, why, that, why is that? Did we win? He says, oh, yeah. And I said, I'm still not going. Just because people like you go, I'm not going. Not really. But there's so much for us to do. There's so many distractions. You, can, you, you know what you can do is you can get on TikTok and spend several hours a day. You know how I know that? As a friend of mine, I, I guess it was TikTok, it was something he was watching, and he had to put a timer on his phone. I didn't even know you could do this, but he put a timer on his phone so he can only watch whatever social media thing he was watching for three hours a day. And I said, you watch that for three hours a day? He said, well, I was up to six and eight before. I'm like, when did you have time to work? He said, well, that's the problem. I was told I needed to find another job. Come and see is more effective than shut up and listen. Number five, no one can argue with your story. You know, people can argue with whether or not baptism is essential to salvation. I've had that argument with several people. People can argue whether or not Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And, and the one that gets me is when I'm talking to people, they will say to me, the Bible misrepresents this or misrepresents this or the Bible contradicts itself. That's the one that I get all the time. You know the Bible contradicts itself. And I will say, where? Show me where it contradicts itself. And now there are a few people that show me some things and I answer it and so forth. But for the most part, they will say something like, well, I don't know, but I've heard that. And they can argue with you. They, they can argue with you about whether or not it's okay to have communion every Sunday. They can argue with you about a cappella singing. But the one thing that no one can argue with me about is what Jesus Christ has done in my life and how he has saved me. He, no one can argue with what God is doing through me and in me. And that's the story we need to tell. We need to tell our story because the most conviction that we can have on others is how God has changed our life. Number six, God wants his enemies to be won over, not wiped out. He says, do I take any pleasures in the death of the wicked, declares the sovereign Lord. Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? God does not want our enemies to be wiped out. 
I've got at the bottom of your sermon notes John 3.16 because it is so important for us to continue to remember. Most of you can quote that verse. You've learned it since you were a child. Some of you have seen it on TV at ball games. But it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes on him shall be saved and have everlasting life. We need to remember that that's what the Bible is about. That God so loved the world. He loves the people that can't drive, amen? He loves the people that are mean, amen? He loves the people that tell you you're number one in traffic. He loves the people that ask for money that don't deserve it. He loves them so much that he gave them his one and only son. When I was younger, my dad did an invitation every Sunday. And it's pretty much the same invitation. He would talk about if you're here and you need to be baptized this is the day to do it. And then he would talk about if you're here and you need to repent of sin, and especially if it's public sin, you need to come forward and you need to do this. And for the longest time, I thought the invitation was about bad people coming forward and making things right. I even argued with my dad that the invitation song's not in the Bible, so we need to cut it out. It's an argument that I didn't win, but I still am right. But now I know something about an imitation song. And I think because we do it all the time, it becomes rote. Just like sometimes when we do communion. By the way, Brent, loved your communion service today. It was awesome. It was pretty much a mini sermon. And that's the reason why we're getting out late. <laughs> this is the only church you can do that to one another and still love one another. But the invitation song is about whether or not you worship today. You see, that's the song that we use to encourage one another to leave here differently than when we came in. That's the song that we get to reflect on. You see, a lot of us, when we come into church, we're harassed, right? We may have been fighting with our spouse, and whatever you do, husbands, do not say amen right now. <laughs> Somebody did that in the first service, I'm going to be doing a lot of counseling. We've been arguing with our children. We've been arguing with our spouse. We're thinking about the things that we've got to do next week. We're thinking about the fact that the toilet went bad and we're going to have to fix it when we get home. we got all of these things surrounding us. And we come in, and sometimes we come in late. And if you came in late today, it's okay. I love you anyway. But we come in late, and we're not prepared to worship. And Jason starts to singing, and I watch it happen almost every Sunday in the first and second service that it's about the second or third song that you really start to sing. Because you've got to let go of all those things that are going on around you. And, and maybe it's in the communion service. Maybe it's in the scripture reading. Maybe it's in the prayer. Maybe it's in the sermon. Maybe it's in the song that you're singing. But at some point in worship, you should quit focusing on everything about you and start focusing on an almighty God. Because when you focus on an almighty God and what his word teaches you and what he has done in your life, you cannot leave here unchanged. And when we sing this invitation song, it is nothing more to encourage you to leave here changed. The lesson is yours as we stand and sing.